See, I knew what I was doing, and I had many followers, and I had all kinds of authority, but I counted all of that as rubbish, dumb, garbage, because now the Lord is the Lord of my life. I have found, I have, I have exchanged, if you will. It is really an accounting term. You have the debits and you have the credits, and so it is here is the incomparable greatness of Jesus Christ. What about the direction of our lives? O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is what? It is not in himself uh, that walketh to direct his steps. I think I messed that up, didn't I, Jay? Can you quote it for me? You got it close enough. I did close enough. Well, all right. I know one person is listening. Thank you for letting me pick on you. Uh, the Israelites, of course, they demonstrated abundantly that they were not listening to the Lord. They needed direction in their lives. And familiarity with the Old Testament tells us that as they have uh, refused to seek direction from the Lord, that's what Jeremiah is trying to get them to do. As they are refusing to seek direction from the Lord, where did they end up? Well, they ended up in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. I know Jeremiah 25, 11 says that. For 70 years they were in captivity. But don't you and I need focus? Uh, the focus of the Lord, direction from the Lord, as we're living our lives. If you were to think about it like this, you can just answer for yourself. Think about your own life. And it may or may not be true. I'm just saying evaluate, reevaluate your own life. But could you say something like this? I'm thinking about the countless ways in my life that I have just utterly messed up. The things I've done, the things I know good and well I shouldn't have done, the things I've said that I have, I have messed up my life. But then, had I been listening to the Lord, how my life would have been so much better. Yes, the Lord will revolutionize your life and my life. And as an ancillary benefit of that, certainly society has benefited. You fill society with better people who are acting better, doing what is right. Certainly things are going to get better. But the reality is when we look at this world and our focus would be this world and the things of this world, then we're going to get off course. That's what I'm trying to say about the Israelites. That is indeed what they did. That's, that's, what, hap that's what happened to them. I want you to look at this passage. I thought about this passage. We are here, of course, to worship and we're thankful for the opportunity and we want to be mindful of those who are not able to be with us. And we want to be mindful of the continued blessings that the Lord gives to us. In Colossians chapter 3, it is in verse 16. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now that's what we've been trying to do. Daryl has done a wonderful job. Thank you, brother, for the good job you've done for the song selection. For all who are participating, we're singing one to another. How encouraging it is to hear these young voices that I'm sitting in front of and to, to hear voices over here, to hear somebody over here singing bass or whatever it be. Somebody said, I hear you singing in the grass. Well, all right, at least be thankful for that. You know, I'm going to make a joyful noise unto the Lord one way or the other. But we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth, and we're going to worship, as this says, uh, in all wisdom and teaching. That is, we're paying attention to God. That, that is our focus, of course, as we have gathered on this occasion. Now, look at verse 17. We didn't read it, did we? Verse 17, And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. The way you do all things in the name of the Lord is to do what the Lord tells you to do. That's what I was struggling to say earlier. I don't know how well it came out. I'm going to do something in the name of the Lord, somebody says. Well, whatever we teach, I believe that's what he's saying, our words and our deeds and our actions emanate from what the Word of God says. Uh, that is, what we're teaching and what we're doing must comport with the teaching of Christ. Just because I say, well, I'm going to do something in the name of the Lord, and, and I'm not sure it has anything to do with God's will, but I'm thinking about the Lord, then that makes it all right. It doesn't make it all right. It doesn't honor the Lord. What honors the Lord is when you and I take up what the Word of God says. 
unless you're thinking that you can direct your own steps, unless I'm thinking the same thing, and I think we're going to agree that we, we have failed miserably at, at that very thing. What about daily living? What about the home? What about, what about work? That is, the Lord must be the Lord of our lives, the totality of our lives. It may be that we compartmentalize our service to the Lord. Well, we're faithful here. We're here Sunday morning. We're partaking the Lord's Supper and we're singing songs and all of these kinds of things. That's what we need to be doing. There's no doubt about that. But the reality is, of course, is that there is much more to serving the Lord than just what we do here. Let's not minimize what we're doing, but you're going to agree, I believe, when I say that when we leave the church building, we need to what? Well, we need to make sure the Lord continues to be the Lord of our lives. And that's what the Apostle Paul is telling us. I just love this. Look in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. You think about the way Paul lived his life. Therefore, since we have this ministry, there is that glorious ministry. Ministry, of course, you have the word servant in that word ministry. As we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. That is, I'm not giving up. I'm not going to quit. We've come this far by faith. We've come too far, haven't we, to give up now. That is, we, we're serving the Lord. We, we've come too far. We don't want to give up now. Paul. Now, what about Paul's life? In fact, how did the Corinthians think about how were they treating him? Let's see if we can find this. Look in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 10. Now, how would you like somebody to say this about you? Here you are. You're trying to help these people, preach the gospel to them, trying to be a blessing and a servant to them. This is what they said, 2 Corinthians 10 and 10. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. I'm not sure how he looked physically. I think about him maybe being stooped over. He'd been beaten with rods and stone and everything like that. His speech is contemptible. I don't really believe that. I believe they're casting aspersions on him to try to denigrate, to try to, to try to lessen his influence. Paul was an educated man. If you wanted to launch out in a little side point on his education and rhetoric and his ability uh, to put words together uh, coherently. But they're speaking pejoratively about Paul. But Paul says, okay, I understand that, but I'm still willing. I'm willing to spend and what? Be spent on your behalf. Why? Because the Lord is the Lord of my life. That's what my life is all about. My focus is not on myself. I'm not living for myself. I'm living for you. I'm living for somebody else. Look at verse 2. Chapter 4, we're not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully. Back up and look in chapter 2 and verse 17. Look in 2 Corinthians 2 and 17. For we are not, he says, as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Uh, let me briefly make this comment. If a teacher in the first century walks into the agora, the agora, however you pronounce that, the marketplace, in the city of Corinth, and says, I've got something to say, will, will you folks listen to me? They would say, yes, we'd like to hear what you have to say. I mean, the Corinthians were imbued with this sense of importance of the wisdom of the ancients, the Aristotle and Plato, Socrates. But then they would say something like this, you want to talk to us, we're willing to listen, but how much should we pay you? And when Paul says, I don't want your money, they say, well, you are worthless. You, you are not competent. If, if you're not charging for what you say, what you say is not important. Now, the Corinthians were impugning his motives anyway. And what he says to them, really what he says to them, I have the right to demand that you support the gospel. By the way, 
Can I say that they were acting kind of snotty? Is that okay to say in sermon? That's the way they were acting. They were acting in a way that was certainly out of out of kelter with, with who Jesus Christ is. And he says, I don't want your money. I didn't behave deceitfully because the Lord is the Lord of my life. Look in verse 5, chapter 4. We do not preach ourselves. We're not talking about ourselves. It is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, verse 6. So you put all of those things together, you see. He's living in the light. He's walking in the light. His conduct is good. It's not shameful. I want you to think about it like this. Look in verse 5, the very last part of verse 5. You see the word servant or bond servant? Certainly Paul was a bond servant, a slave to Christ. But really he was a bond servant to the Corinthians. And he, his life of sacrifice, of dedication, not only to the Corinthians, but certainly to them, in spite of the way that they were acting, in spite of the way they were conducting themselves, he says, I still want to serve you. You see this, for example, look in verse 8. We think we have problems. I'm not minimizing that we don't have problems. I'm not saying we don't. Look at verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Listen to this. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And would you enjoy living under the constant possibility, the constant threat of death? He'll talk about this later in chapter 11. So you put it all together. And let me just close this part of this point. Look in verse 5 again. Bond servant, servant. If Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, if Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, then we need to be servants. We need to serve the Lord. We need to serve each other. I, I believe there are servants in this church. I'm not the Lord. I'm not the judge. By their fruits you shall know them. Answer for yourself. The greater consideration would be, am I doing what the Lord tells me to do? not what you're doing. And then the last point of our lesson is this, the Lord of destiny. There's coming that last day in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. That's John 5, 28 and 29. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. The apostle Peter talks about the time when the Lord will say, this is enough. And when the Lord says, this is enough, then it's going to be enough. And the world that we live in now will be dissolved. The elements shall melt with fervor heat. And so it is that last day is coming. Do we know when? No, we don't know when that last day is coming. But the Son of Man, as he is identified in Matthew 25, gathers all nations before him, the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And what he does is he separates. There is a separation. That's what judgment is all about. There are those who have done the bidding of the Savior. There are those who have refused to do that. And so he says, Enter thou in into the joys of thy Lord. Enter in thou faithful servant. To those on the left, to those who are unprepared, depart. I never knew you. Now how can he do this? He can do this because he has all authority. And let this idea, let this thread of the authority of Christ be woven throughout our, our lives as we're thinking about Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives. He has all authority. It was by that authority that he sends his apostles into all the world and preach the gospel. And we are the beneficiaries of his authority even today. When I say open up your Bibles, you have a Bible, you're looking at God's word. It is an expression of, and we recognize the expression of his authority. But there's something else about this matter of destiny. Look in 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 1. For we know that of our earthly house this tent is destroyed. 
We have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Can't we imagine? That's why Paul said, I don't lose heart. I'm not growing weary. Paul, I don't understand it. You've been beaten half to death. You're living under the sentence of death. These pesky Corinthians are just aggravating the life out of you. You're trying to help them, but they turn to death here to these overtures, these magnanimous displays of love and concern. He says, I, I'm not going to lose heart. I, I've come too far to give up now. And so it is. Paul says he did, and you and I do. We have a building. I'll tell you what, this tent is being destroyed. But it is the, the life that you and I have now. It, it's fading away. It's passing away. The Lord never intended that uh, our existence now would be the would be the ultimate end of what true life is all about. And so it is. We live, and then we pass from the scenes of mankind. I'm not saying we have a morbid curiosity with death or anything like that. Life is precious. We ought to be sensible and be cautious and preserve it and be wise. But what the Apostle Paul says is, I know that I'm, in fact, he says, for to me to live is Christ, and what? To die is gain. So death is coming, and I'll tell you, that's not the end. Something else is coming, and that's the resurrection. We have the hope of Christ to be raised to life and light and immortality through the gospel. The exaltation of Christ now in this life. But you think about this, the exaltation of who you are as a spiritual being made in the image of God. First John 3, 1 and 2, is that the passage where John says, we will see him, we'll see him and be like he is. If you can explain that, I'd be glad for you to preach on that verse. I've thought about it many, many times. We'll see him and be like he is. And while I can't really wrap my feeble mind around it, around it, I want to be like he is, don't you? We want to be like he is, and we are, we can be somewhat like he is now. And so it is. There is one and only one Savior, Jesus Christ, as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. As we bring this lesson to a close, you can see, will you acknowledge Jesus as Lord? How do you do that? Well, you do that by doing what he tells you to do, by obeying his will. Not all, uh, if, whoever calls upon me, Lord, Lord, why do you call me, Lord, Lord, I'm trying to say, Luke 6, 46, why do you call me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I'm going to say it very plainly, as kindly as I can. Don't sit there and think that the Lord is the Lord of your life if you're not doing what he tells you to do. You can't have it both ways. Needs be that what, what you and I can do is we can obey the Lord and we hope and pray that you'll do that even now. Obey the Lord in baptism to have your sins washed away in the precious blood of God's Son. Maybe you've done